The talk is entitled, What Japan's Past Disasters Can Teach Us About the Age of Climate Change. And of course, disasters are a prominent topic, unfortunately, in the history of Japan. Uh, Japan is very densely populated. It is one of the most seismically active zones on the globe. And many of you may have traveled to Japan and experienced an earthquake there. But you may as well have seen the, dis the disruptions uh, caused by, say, landslides, heavy rain, summer typhoons, tropical cyclones, uh, and other um, instances of disaster that are really quite frequent in Japan. But the most uh, probably watershed moment in recent history, as Rebecca mentioned, is the disaster of March 11, uh, 2011, which is almost exactly 13 years ago today, 10 years, 13 years and 10 days, um, in which a nine magnitude nine earthquake rocked the ocean bed just off the coast of Northeast Japan. And you can see here a picture of this dramatic or fatal moment, uh, the tsunami rolling into the harbor of Miyako, a town in Iwate Prefecture, northeastern Japan. And this picture for me, I think it, it takes down quite a few myths about what a tsunami is really like, because maybe you may associate the idea of a tsunami wave with this like blue, you know, Hokusai style wave that crashes down over Mount Fuji, but no, it is a black rolling mass of mud and debris. Uh, it's it's not, not beautiful and very da dangerous. The picture was taken from the roof of a building that was, that was uh, left standing, one of the few. Um, and the tsunami kept swelling up to 14 meters, rolling over towns, harbors, fields, and also over a nuclear power plant, Fukushima Daiichi, which was built right on the shore um, of, uh, of Fukushima Prefecture. In the aftermath of the nuclear meltdown that ensued, a broader awareness emerged in Japan, but also abroad that natural disasters, so-called natural disasters, are never completely natural. After all, um, a disaster only becomes a disaster once its ramifications ripple through human society, and in that process they are uh, refracted by political um, power, social inequalities, the organization of human society, right? And that, I think, illustrates how disaster is primarily a social issue. But also the creation of disasters itself is oftentimes socially conditioned. And that is something that we're rising or growing more and more aware in the 21st century, as we think about, you know, global uh, sea level rise, mass extinction events, uh, unprecedented hikes in atmospheric CO2. These are all processes that are environmental, they're natural in a way, but they are also closely tied to humans, their culture and their politics and the way we make political decisions, such as, um, you know, how we fuel our economy. Uh, this slide here uh, is a radiation chart from Fukushima Prefecture. You can see here, it's a screenshot I took when I traveled myself to uh, the disaster region a few years ago. Um, you can see there is a road here that goes across the um, exclusion zone. The exclusion zone is defined by the government, this green line here. You cannot go inside except if you travel across it without getting off the bus. Um, along the streets, you can see that decontamination efforts have been undertaken and uh, that results in a warmer color here on the radiation chart. This here is the, um, the broken down power plant uh, symbolized by this nuke symbol here. Um, and I think this picture also is sort of a visualization of a man-made risk scale, right? And that um, sort of also raises the question, what, how do we understand our sort of um, engagement with risks that weren't here uh, before the so-called Anthropocene, right? So insurance companies, and we have an expert here who will maybe challenge me on this, but the way I understand it, insurance companies primarily define risk as a numeric probability that a conceivable hazard will materialize within a defined time horizon. And we've just been talking that most contracts are term by one year and then you renegotiate, right? So time horizons are important here. And as historians, we like to, you know, expand the time horizon a little bit or the historical perspective and see what happens. And that's in a way experimental in this case. Now disasters um, are the large scale materialization of this risk. And they again are framed as contained intervals of time between an onset and an end. Uh, and like that, you can define a clear uh, toll of lives and goods that are then insurable, perhaps. 
And this definition has proven useful uh, in order to ensure damage for punctual incidents, such as fire or an avalanche or so. But then what if um, the age of climate change is not a punctual disaster, but sort of an ongoing state of changing, alterated and changing, continually changing risk scapes, right? How do we behave in this landscape? Now, you may say neither the tsunami itself uh, nor um, the nuclear meltdown is directly related to anything um, climate change, right? It's, it's seismology after all. Uh, but I would argue that the problems with which this disaster confronts us lead back to the same questions as climate change, namely, how do we make collective decisions in view of unequal distributions of risk and opportunity? And as a historian, here again, risk escapes. As a historian, I approach these questions uh, again through historical sources. And one of the um, sources that I find the most fascinating to read with my students in class are these stone inscriptions, which you will find all along the coast of northeastern Japan, uh, stone stela that um, commemorate early disasters. This one here commemorates a tsunami of 1896. And by the way, we'll get to this later. There are there is a certain rhythm of major tsunamis striking all these in Japan. You can see 1896, 1933, 1960, 2011. It's an intergenerational rhythm, and this temporality of disaster is a problem because that means that whoever was in charge in 1933 will have retired by 1960, and same by 19 people who witnessed 1960 will be retired by 2011, and that affects the way we remember, but also the way we sort of form our policies around personal experiences, right? So this stila here, um, again, commemorating the tsunami of 1996, reads, remember the terrible disaster of the great tsunami. Do not build below this, this point. And the stone, I don't remember which one it would be on the, I think it's somewhere here. Uh, can't see it anyway. <laughs> um, it, it is in an elevated position that marks how high did the tsunami come, how far inland, and then do not build below this zone, this point. But people did, of course, out of practical reasons, go back to the shore. And sure enough, um, in 1933, there was another tsunami uh, that devastated. This is the village of Taro, uh, that's a little further south near Miyako as well. Um, you can see this village was completely devastated, only eight buildings left intact. Already in 1896, uh, I think the town lost three quarters of its population to the tsunami. This time it was about half, uh, so maybe there were improvements in, you know, people knew where to run and such, but still, um, people did rebuild in a dangerous zone. And uh, uh, Stela nearby laments again, how forgetful is the human race? Those who will see the Stela in days to come must remain cautious and careful not to be oblivious again. And so you have this sort of, um, I guess, repentance about having forgotten what had happened just about 40 years earlier, right? And this makes me want to ask, what more does it take than uh, an admonishment set in stone, right? It's not going to be washed away by rain. What more does it take to make us remember these disasters? But perhaps it's smarter to ask, what are the ambitions behind the decision to embrace time and again the risk of living on the shoreline, right? Because uh, after all, historical memory is not something that you can just write down, archive, put in a drawer or on a stone and let moss grow over it. Historical memory needs to be alive and that means it needs to circulate in a in a pu public debate, a political debate, right? And the historian Peter Dews, who is also a historian of Japan, uh, once said that the pattern of reaction to catastrophic disaster can be broken down into five uh, overlapping phases and he uh, termed them as blaming, second coping, third hoping, fourth, learning, and fifth, forgetting. And in a way, it's ironic, but it's it's true, because forgetting is an integral part of collective memory, uh, as any historian can tell. We choose what to remember and what not to remember, and that is an act of selection according to a certain agenda, uh, according to subjective also points of view at time, and that is natural. We cannot uh, help it, but it also shows that uh, the creation of collective memory is uh, a political act of negotiating between uh, concerns about safety and possibility, opportunity, ambition, and traditional knowledge vis-a-vis -vis modern science and make the promise of technological fixes to these problems. Um, 
That takes me to 1960, when the next major tsunami arrived in northeastern Japan. And this time there was no, unlike previous disasters, no major earthquake ahead of the tsunami. Uh, people knew that when there's an earthquake, you should uh, you know, run uphill. Uh, that was general knowledge. And this time it didn't happen because the earthquake took place near Santiago de Chile, South America, all the way diagonally across the Pacific. Um, it it um, sent out these tsunami waves that you can see here. It's relatively small, but these lines indicate two hour intervals or one hour intervals, I think. It took 22 hours to arrive in Japan. There, the tsunami was about six meters tall. Before that, it hit Hawaii. Uh, tsunami was about 2.9 meters tall there. That is due to underwater topography, right? How the wave uh, rises. And in Japan, it again caused a huge uh, material, but also a human life toll um, because there was no warning. So people in Hawaii uh, experienced the disaster. They were considered enough to pick up the phone and call Tokyo in 1960. You had telephone, of course. But then in Tokyo, it was middle of the night. The Japan Meteorological Agency's offices were closed. And so the warning did not come to the shore. And that moment was also a decisive moment or a transformative moment in the creation of transnational warning systems, seismological warning systems. Um, for the first time, governments tried to you know, integrate and, and sort of like update each other lifetime on these hazards. And it created something like a pan-Pacific, perhaps also um, network of information sharing, but also maybe an identity as well, right? We're sitting in this together. And that get us, gets us to um, the tsunami of 2011. Um, here we're looking at, again, the power plant uh, of Fukushima Daiichi built in the late 1960s. That was just about less than a decade after this last major tsunami. Uh, but it seemed wise to build uh, the power plant on the shore for practical reasons. And the reactors that Japan purchased were designed in the United States, uh, where obviously the engineers did their best to make them as safe as possible. And the hazard they were most familiar with was tornadoes. Um, and this is actually here a graph from Masahishi Moon was published a few months after the disaster that shows how, well, if the problem had been a tornado, it would have been good because <laughs> the uh, safety aggregates for electricity were put in the basement where no like you know flying trees or so would, would damage them. But then what happened unfortunately was that a tsunami came and it swamped the whole emergency aggregates. And that means that the emergency cooling of the reactors failed and that led to the meltdown. So that was very uh, tragic. Japanese engineers too emulated the technological achievements of their American allies, of course, at the time, and they were blinded to the obvious, which seems strange to us. And there was this one, um, let's see, um, um, retired director of Fukushima Daiichi. He, he was the, the director of the plant in the 1990s. But he remembered in 2011, uh, New York Times quoted him, we can only work on precedent. And there was no precedent. When I had the plant, the thought of a tsunami never crossed my mind. After all, it had never happened that a tsunami struck uh, uh, a nuclear power plant, right? So depending on how you define the precedent, that's actually true what he says, right? Um, but still, I mean, after the event, you're always smarter. And yet, how could engineering decisions at the highest level be so de fatally really decoupled from basic knowledge of the local environment and its hazards, right? And I think that points us a bit to a problem also that is um, maybe not unique to Fukushima, but here we can see that um, local and experience-based knowledge, vernacular knowledge, the local memory have been replaced and not augmented by modern science, right? And so that uh, is, I guess, expressive about a problem about um, the way knowledge is constructed in science. It is exclusive, right? Not everything makes it into the Excel sheet because it's not numerically convertible. Maybe with seismology, we can reconstruct a lot. Uh, the examples I brought up here are all from uh, an era in which relatively accurate uh, seismographic uh, records are kept, but still in a longer term. And then the human experience are not really expressed in the data sheets that go into the decision-making process. And uh, I mean, again, back in the 1960s, the centralization of authority uh, under what um, economic historians have called an iron triangle in Japan, 
triangle between bureaucracy, corporations, and the political establishment uh, of the Liberal Democratic Party, which ruled the country almost uninterruptedly between 1955 and today. Um, brief interruption just when 211 happened. Um, that this uh, Iron Triangle um, promoted an unwavering trust in nuclear technology that justified silencing uh, local voices of concern. And of course, they had uh, the benefit of, well, evidence on their side because economic growth was real. Uh, between 1945, you see this postcard here, Tokyo was uh, reduced to rubbles. Between 1945 and 1973, you had an annual economic growth of, in some years, way above 10%. I think the yeah, late 60s, we're looking at something like 18% or something. Uh, standard of life is really improving for the masses. And that, like 1964, Tokyo Olympics, right? It's not even 20 years difference between these two pictures. In the late 1970s, uh, the American, um, well, area study scholar Ezra Fogel uh, called Japan number one because it was on the tra trajectory to taking over the pole position in global GDP rankings. But of course, this um, Japanese economic miracle was not a miracle. It can be explained. And it can be explained through material terms like access to cheap energy sources, Middle Eastern, uh, you know, petroleum, nuclear energy. But then it can also be explained through the sacrifice that was demanded, the toll that the government also found uh, acceptable in order to achieve this growth. And the American historian Brett Walker has written an entire book called, well, provocative title, title Toxic Archipelago, which among other things talks about the Minamoto mercury poisoning incidents um, that were really the um, effect of an unwavering industry first policy uh, over the post-war period. Um, now, in view of these things, one could also say that 211, uh, 311, sorry, 2011 was the materialization of an intergenerational um, bill, so to speak, right? Some people a few years ago had enjoyed easy economic growth, uh, and now uh, the burden is on us today or on the future generations as well. And here again, the time horizons. But in what terms of time are we thinking about this disaster, right? And that expands, obviously, the dimension of damage. Historians like to speak of uh, something called intergenerational justice today, when they analyze the accumulation of such environmental liabilities over longer periods of time. Uh, and this concern is obviously most uh, associated with um, for example, the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere, right? You're burning CO2 now in order to fuel our economy, but then the really consequences of it will be maybe not even on us, but on our children, uh, grandchildren, and so on. And, and time really matters in assessing uh, the meaning of these uh, decisions to continue or not to continue using C um, fossil fuels in this case. But we can also apply the concept to, for example, excessive accumulation of public debts, uh, which in Japan is obviously also a big uh, problem for the next generation. So what are the lessons, since I promised that in the title, lessons for the age of climate change? And um, I think, well, as a historian, I mostly sell questions, not, <laughs> not solutions, but maybe that's something for you to take home. Um, I think Japan has a lot to offer, of course, in terms of technical fixes, how to live in an environment of elevated risks. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that climate change is no longer a problem that can be fixed. It is more of uh, Julia Thomas, another uh, historian of science and technology, calls it a predicament in which we can prevail with more or less uh, dignity, which is a bit fatalist perhaps. But in a way, it is a process of ongoing adaptation, collective adaptation. And in this adaptation, of course, um, while the environment is politicized, the importance of inclusive cultures of knowledge maybe have, has come out of my talk. And um, maybe the insight that lessons from the past cannot be achieved by archiving, but by keeping memory alive in society, right? Um, so, shall we, let's, um, yeah, um, uh, anyway, let's, let's end it with this. So I think let's, let's talk a bit as we go into the Q&A about what that means, resilience versus fixes continuous ad adaptation, inclusive knowledge systems, how can we do this? How can we diversify 
uh, processes of, of decision making, but also how can we relocalize the human experience and sort of go one step back from the abstraction of scientific data and back into the process of assigning meaning to this data, humanly relatable meaning and what that can do to help, uh, you know, also collectively find a sustainable relationship with the environment. Okay, with that, I would like to conclude and look forward to your reactions. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your introduction. Um, just, I have, of course, a few questions. Um, for those here in the room, Madeleine will have a um, microphone if you have questions. Please use it because otherwise the people at home can't hear you. Um, the people at home, you can uh, submit questions via the Q&A function uh, either at the bottom or top of your screen. That's why I have my phone here. I can then read them uh, to Jonas. Um, but I will start uh, with a few questions. Um, you know, do you think that Japan, with his history of disasters, is better prepared uh, for climate change than other regions in the world? Um, so again, I think uh, the technical fixes uh, are something that Japan really can has a lot to teach us. Uh, they have a lot of practical experience of living with risk, of living with, you know, all the drills and like everybody at home has a disaster kit and such. Awareness is really high. That is, that is definitely something um, that Japan is good at. But if you ask me if Japan be is better off, better prepared for climate change, um, again, as a historian, I think I would like to think about this in, in a longer perspective. And I just recently visited Micronesia for my second research, pro next research project, where we're really looking at the disappearance of entire nation states. Kiribati, uh, Tuvalu, Marshall Islands, uh, will be most likely uninhabitable in their entirety by the end of the century. And comparatively, Japan is simply better off. At the same time, Japan I mean, has highly populated centers and agrarian spaces that are close to the shore, not highly elevated. Uh, what I have observed in Japan is a concern with loss of territory, uh, maritime territory, because, for example, the island of Okinotorishima, which is um, 1,200, I think, kilometers south of Tokyo, uh, and comes with a huge, uh, you know, ra uh, radius of, of economic zone. That this island, it's now about three to five centimeters above sea at low tide. That this would disappear, and that has again uh, instigated uh, research as to how do we help coral growth in order to not lose uh, economic zone. And in that sense, like technologically, science-wise, Japan has an edge over, for example, Micronesia. Um, Sorry if I, uh, I answered the question at all. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. um, um, but it struck me a bit um, when reading the article, especially, is that um, this power nuclear power plant was built right at the shore of one of the most seismic uh, regions in the world. And um, how could didn't nobody think about there might be a tsunami? Um, and do you think Japan learned from it? Or is there still also the willingness to take some risks uh, for economy to grow, for society uh, to grow? I think you can't do any business without risk. We always accept some sort of risk. But the question is, where do we draw the line? And who gets to draw that line? And probably people in Taro, for example, the village would probably have remembered in the 1960s, but maybe they weren't asked. And I think that is the problem. Uh, how do we how do we negotiate um, between ambition and yeah ambition and risk again? But it's it's difficult. It's um, I, I can't like present you with a solution. I can just say that this has happened and that was the problem. That uh, local experience was not um, fed into the body of information that made the decision. Yeah. And maybe when going like. To the present now, um, Japan has released wastewater from Fukushima uh, into the ocean uh, starting I think last August. Um, how does their play risk taking, but also political decisions into it, and in, also into the perspective from the neighboring states, um, which of course are concerned about the effects of that? Yeah, I mean there are different ways to look at this question. Um, and 
I mean, there's like the national scale. Japan is the only country in the world that has experienced an atomic bomb against civilian population twice. And that has shaped post-war discourses pertaining to nuclear technology, also like peaceful use, nuclear energy in the country. Um, famously, you may all have heard of Godzilla, right? Uh, it's a product of, or sort of a literary processing of the fear of nuclear fallout. Uh, created in the 1950s and still alive, being reproduced until very recently. Um, that's the national scale, where surprisingly, apparently a large share of the population in Japan was in favor of the water release. Um, whereas at the level of international politics, this decision has been instrumentalized. I mean, that's my citizen opinion here, but uh, governments that have, I guess, historically grown uh, fraught relationship with the with Japan uh, again uh, used this situation to, for example, ban the importation of foodstuff and such. And if you are in China, maybe fisher folks might have been not so unhappy that uh, seafood importations from Japan were banned based on these claims. Right now, since you brought up this uh, nuclear release, um, or, or since you mentioned that it might be an interesting topic to talk about today, I I looked up uh, how much radioactivity was really released. And the answer was something like 539 petabecquerel of cesium-131, I think, off the top of my mind. I can't relate to this. I don't know how many digits such a number would have, but especially I don't know what it means for us as people. Um, do we get How fast do we get sick from it? And that is what ultimately matters. But that is, the, again, to get back to embedding scientific facts in the human experience. If we don't do that, uh, not only are the facts up for instrumentalization and abuse, but also we can't mobilize. I mean, so sorry if I get, go a bit too far off from your question, but how do you um, mobilize the masses to say, uh, not throw away plastic if they don't have a sense of stakeholdership, right? If they don't own the land because it has been expropriated. And again, I'm coming from a post-colonial sort of perspective on Micronesia, um, where you have the whole legacy of the country isn't the Micronesians anymore, right? Um, how do you get people on a large scale to participate in this effort of finding a way into sustainability if you don't bring in humanity into the facts? Sorry, that was again a meandering answer, but I hope I hope it's somehow thought provoking at least. Maybe I have some questions left. Um, so um, maybe just a bit a more uh, personal question. Um, of course, it's uh, very important for uh, Japanese society to remember uh, all of those disasters. They probably will be um, hit by another tsunami someday um as you said there is kind of a rhythm um why do you think or why did you choose to look at um japan's or asia's natural disasters and what is special about it looking uh from that perspective uh at climate change which is usually looked at from a european industrialization um perspective yeah, I mean, you already mentioned it, that there is a strong sort of Eurocentric perspective or bias uh, in, in everything history, in, in the Anglophone context, but more, more so in German, of course, we're not so much aware of um, histories of capitalism, history of disaster, in this case, industrialization. And Japan is particularly, I think, historically relevant in diversifying our understanding of global history, but also global issues like climate change is one. And to see how did Japan become carbonized, for example, right? It's the first industrial revolution outside of Europe the, in the Meiji period taking place in Japan. It coined modalities of economic growth. It coined uh, the vocabulary in which science and, and industry are described throughout Asia, cascaded across Asian um, um, cultures and, and subsequent uh, industrializations. And in that sense, it's quite important, I think, from a historical point of view to, to focus on Japan, even though uh, they're down to, I think, GDP rank four or something now, um, the historical relevance remains. And, and the archive, that's the other aspect. The archive of Japan is very rich because people did write a lot 
people from all sorts of social backgrounds, they write a lot. Um, and that is also something that you don't find in every country that you get, can get a relatively diverse picture of what these processes were like for people of the country. Um, and then one question I've always on because we talked a lot, a lot about uh, forgetting and uh, how did you say it, Nico? Uh, ignoring, ignoring things. Um, society seems to repeat uh, their mistakes. Um, I've always wanted to ask that to a historian. Mm -hmm. Do you think we learn anything from history? <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope we do. Um... <clears throat> The question is not do we learn, but what do we learn? What do we, again, it relates to what Nico said, what do we choose to ignore? What do we choose to canonize? Um, it's a political act. It's an act of power. Um, and I think you, you can't predict the future. And that doesn't mean that history is irrelevant because we can still sort of like try and I guess be culturally prepared for the unknown. And maybe I said before that as a historian, I mostly sell questions, not solutions, <laughs> which I don't mean to be lazy with that. But I mean, I think the important thing is that we keep challenging our assumptions and our beliefs because the future will be unknown and different than we anticipate. And that is probably the chief lesson that we can extract. If you have to give a solution or advice um on yeah the climate change and the environmental and environmental challenges that are uh, ahead of us um how can we tackle them better so don't give up um <laughs> try to make yourself heard and try to listen to the perspectives that are not on the radar because it's important that we diversify the understanding of what we're up to and how we're going to navigate that. Thank you.